You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Hi, and welcome to The Blackest Questions. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Greer, politics editor for The Griot and associate professor of political science at Fordham University. In this podcast, we ask our guests five of The Blackest Questions so we can learn a little bit more about them and have some fun while we're doing it. We're also going to learn a lot about Black history, past and present. So here's how this works. We have five rounds of questions about us, Black history, the entire diaspora, current events, you name it. And with each round, the questions get a little tougher, and the guest has 10 seconds to get it right. If they answer the question correctly, they'll receive one symbolic black fist, and they'll hear this. And if they get it wrong, they'll hear this. But we still love them anyway. And after the five questions, there'll be a black bonus round at the end just for fun. And I like to call it Black Lightning. So our guest for this episode is two-time Oscar nominee and six-time Grammy winner, Terrence Blanchard. Terrence has been a consistent artistic force for making powerful musical statements concerning painful American tragedies, past and present. And from his expansive work composing the scores for almost 20 Spike Lee projects over three decades, ranging from the documentary When the Levees Broke to the latest Lee film, The Five Bloods, where Terrence received an Oscar nomination for his original score in 2021, which marked his second nomination. Terrence previously received an Oscar nomination for his original score for Spike Lee's Black Klansman. Terrence became only the second Black composer to be nominated twice in the original score category, duplicating Quincy Jones's feat from 1967's In Cold Blood and 1985's The Color Purple. More recently, Terrence also scored One Night in Miami, wrote the original score for The Woman King, directed by Gina Prince Blythewood, starring Viola Davis, which opened in theaters on September 16th. And he wrote the original score for the upcoming Apple Plus TV documentary, Louis Armstrong's Black and Blues, which will be released on October 28th. Terrence has also composed his second opera, Fire Shut Up In My Bones, based on the memoir of celebrated writer and New York Times columnist, Charles Blow. And he continues recording with his longtime jazz band, Absence, the E Collective and the Turtle Island Quartet. And lastly, Terrence just received another Emmy nomination this year for They Call Me Magic, which was nominated for the Outstanding Musical Composition for a Documentary Series or Special. I am so excited to welcome you, Terrence. Thank you so much for joining The Blackest Questions. Hey, how you doing, Dr. Greer? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So the last time I saw you, you were performing with Herbie Hancock. Yes. Um, and now you're about to present your second opera at the Met, and you're working on this new Louis Armstrong project. Please tell us about both of those exciting new projects. Well, you know, I'm excited about the, the opera at the Met. It's actually my first opera, uh, and it's about Emil Griffith, who was a welterweight fighter, you know, who never came out as gay, but struggled with his sexuality. And in one of his fights in the press uh, event before the fight, he was outed by his opponent. And he was outraged because, you know, you didn't do those types of things back then in the 60s. And he wound up killing that opponent in the ring, you know. And um, it was a really rough thing for him because there's a tagline in his biography where, it's, where he said, you know, I killed a man and the world forgave me, but I love the man and the world wants to kill me. And that became the, the kind of motive behind doing the opera, the whole notion of redemption. Um, and then with Louis Armstrong's Black and Blues, I mean, that was just an honor to work on that, frankly. You know, when people called me to uh, be a part of it, I was just overwhelmed, you know, because, I mean, that's Louis Armstrong. And he's the father of all of this stuff, man. Right. So the first thing I thought of was don't play on it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't play on it, you know. Wait, but so you, are you going to, you don't play on it or do you play on oh, it? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't play on it at all. No way. I mean, you are arguably one of the best trumpet players of our generation. How are you not playing on a Louis Armstrong piece? Because it's Louis Armstrong, <laughs> you know, so but and and we have a lot of his music there. You know what I mean? So the, I, I didn't feel a need to have competing trumpets. It's really about Louis. And we just wanted to hear his music, his musical voice and his actual voice. His actual uh, voice. But what I did was I brought the turtle on a string quartet in. And I took this kind of harmonic uh, a segment from uh, this old rocking chair, which is a piece, you know, Lewis would do with Jack Teagarden. 
because it just was so sentimental and so emotional for me. And I used that kind of as the emotional backdrop for the documentary. Wow. Okay. So may, most people know you as a trumpeter, but I know you play other instruments. Walk us through the other instruments and sort of tell us how you got into each of those instruments. Well, I play piano, as you can see keyboard behind me. Um, but that was the first thing. That's where I actually started for me. I started playing piano when I was about five years old. And I always wanted to be a drummer. And my mom would never let me be a drummer because we had a drummer in the house, my cousin. Okay. Was, so she didn't want to have two drummers in the house. So those basically are the two instruments that I kind of mess around with. I, I compose on the piano all the time. But like, if, for example, in some of the percussion stuff that you hear in The Woman King, it's actually me playing. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So not all, I mean, not all your, your latent drummer? Of course, all the time. <laughs> now, with the with the Louis Armstrong piece, you know, so many people know him for his trumpeting. I personally absolutely love his voice. Yes. So what about, you know, what did you discover in working on this, this piece? Uh, is there anything new that, you know, I mean, obviously you're a son of New Orleans, you know a lot about Louis Armstrong and, and sort of the entire orbit that he was in, but did you learn anything new, uh, not just about either his playing style or his vocal style that sort of surprised you even this late in the game? Well, the things that I learned had nothing to do with the music, actually. It had more to do with his social awareness, you know? I kind of knew that Pops was always socially aware was, of what was going on in America. He just didn't speak on it. But the way his wife talked about it in the documentary was profound for me because Pops knew where he was in his life and where his career was in the development of America. And he knew that the most important thing was for him to get this music out there. So he decided not to make statements about some social events, but it didn't mean that he wasn't aware of those things, you know? And as a result, what started to happen is it allowed the younger generation to flourish in this world of jazz. And then they became the spokespeople mm -hmm. to speak out about social injustice in this country. But the problem was, since we didn't know this about Lewis, we always used to make this assumption about him and it's totally false. And you actually hear this in his own words in a documentary. That's one of the things that I love about it. Oh, I cannot wait for this documentary. I love, love, love Louis Armstrong on a whole host of levels, but I have such great uh, love and admiration for his work and I, I cannot wait to see what you did to it. Um, okay, so are you ready to play The Blackest Questions? I'm a little nervous, but I'm all, I'll be okay. <laughs> well, as I tell every guest, Black history is American history. And so we're on this journey together. Um, okay. okay, so we're gonna, first question. Mm -hmm. Popular, popularizing a new approach to improvisation, arguably mm -hmm. making it the best jazz album ever to be released. Although mm -hmm. released nearly 65 years ago, this album remains popular among its listeners. What is the name of the album? Kind of Blue, Miles Davis. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. So Kind of Blue <laughs> is a studio album by American jazz trumpeter, composer, and band leader Miles Davis. It was recorded on March 2nd and April 22nd in 1959 at Columbia's 30th Street Studio in New York City. And it was released on August 17th of that year by Columbia Records. Kind of Blue brought together seven now legendary musicians in the prime of their careers. There was tenor saxophonist John Coltrane, alto saxophonist Julian Cannonball Adderley, pianist Bill Evans and Wynton Kelly, bassist Paul Chambers, drummer Jimmy Cobb, and of course, trumpeter Miles Davis. And rather than basing its five tunes on a rigid framework of changing chords, it was conventional for post-bop music, and Miles Davis and Bill Evans wrote pieces for a more limited set of scales in different modes. So you got that one quick, fast, in a hurry. Um, well, yeah, and I know, I know, that's my wheelhouse, so yeah. Right. Yeah. I know Miles Davis is one of your musical inspirations. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned Clifford Brown in the past and Clark Turtle and Roger Dickerson. You know, mm -hmm. it also sounds like in, in other interviews we've done and that I've heard, you come from somewhat of a musical family. So tell us about some of these musical inspirations for you. Well, yeah, I mean, it all started with my family. I mean, growing up in New Orleans, you know, you hear music all the time. You hear live performance all the time. And you don't really think about it. You think the rest of the world is like, <laughs> it's like that, you know. Um, and you kind of take it for granted at first. But once I started to realize that we were special, it really made me understand how, you know, this had such a huge effect on my life. My father sang opera. My mom's sister taught piano and voice. My grandfather played guitar. 
they all sang and performed in church on every Sunday, you know, and then we'd go out to recitals and stuff like that. But then when I started to really delve into the world of modern jazz, when I started to listen to Miles Davis and Clark Terry and Clifford Brown, all of those guys just really, really just opened my eyes to the possibility of what was able to be accomplished in the world of creativity. But here's the thing about it, though. You know, it really also opened my eyes to, again, this whole thing of social injustice in our country, because mm -hmm. I grew up believing that if you accomplish something, you would be a household name in this country. And most people didn't know these things. They didn't know who these guys were. And for me, that was a travesty because they were great musicians. They were people who really changed the course of music. Nobody's changed the course of music more than Miles Davis, mm -hmm. you know. And you know, when you think about Clark Terry and Clifford Brown, those guys had a huge effect on the world of music as well. You know, and they also should be household names. Time for a quick break. We'll be right back. Introducing Deer Culture with Panama Jackson on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Griot mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Griot mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. Welcome back to The Blackest Questions. Do you remember the first piece that you ever composed? You know, it's like, I know that you played piano and, you know, you learned your scales on the trumpet. And, and I've told you, you know, when I finished my dissertation, I went out and bought a trumpet the next day because I just needed to, like, let the world know that I finished this project. And there's this long history of Black women playing the trumpet. But what's, what? do you remember how old you were and where you were when you composed your very first piece? Yes, I was about 15 or 16 years old. I was studying with Roger Dickerson in New Orleans, and he made me write a piano piece based off of a six note tone row. And it was and I, it was called Fantasy in Space <laughs> when I was a kid. The unfortunate thing is that, man, I lost it in the, in the hurricane, you know, but I had a I had a printed version of it. And uh, it was the only one, you know, we didn't have digital right. stuff back then. So it was the only one that I had and, and it got destroyed in the hurricane. Oh my goodness. So what's your creative process? Because I mean, you know, you have created the soundtrack. I mean, for not just for Spike Lee, but for a lot of black folks who know your music and really appreciate your music, you've created a soundtrack for our lives. How do you sort of sit down either at, at the piano or what is your process? Do you need do you need to be alone? Do you need to be with your people? You know, do you have a, a glass of wine? <laughs> is it just like, you know, where are we? Is it morning time? Is it nighttime? All of the above. After all of the, all of the above? <laughs> no, no. I mean, for me, it's a solitary kind of existence, you know. Um, and I, it's one of the things that I tell my students in terms of studying composition, because inspiration comes from anywhere, you know. So the process always changes based on the, the project. Sometimes, man, you know, I could hear a rhythm and then all of a sudden that'll become the basis of something or I can hear a sound and the color of the sound will kind of give me inspiration, mm -hmm. you know, or sometimes little melodic things pop in my head. It really depends, you know, like when I'm working on a film, I try to let the film speak to me. I try to let that tell me what it needs by the pace of the dialogue, where it's cut and all of those things. And when it's time for me to write for my band, it's really just about what it is that I want to say. So I try to clear my mind and allow these things to give me starting points, mm -hmm. you know, places to start. And then the com then the composer in me kind of takes over and s takes this idea and say, okay, well, I can do this, I can do this. What are the things that I want to, how do I want to use this idea? Uh, then it starts, everything starts to fall into place. So, it, but you know what it really boils down to? You know, it boils down to listening, mm. you know? It boils down to being open to what the idea is telling you that it needs and what it wants to do. That's brilliant. 
So, I mean, what do you do? I know we have a lot of musicians who listen to the podcast. What do you do if you're stuck? You know, so it's like there's something, you know, I I'm I used to quilt. And so sometimes it's like it's moving along. I feel like the the quilt is speaking to me, but then there's a piece where it's just like I'm I don't know where to go next. And I know that I I've been on this road, but like I'm right, I'm, right, I'm a little right. stuck. Well, you know, that happens time from time to time, but that's the reason why your tools really that's where the tools come into play you know mm -hmm. like for example when i'm working with my students and i they come up with an idea i show them how to get you know thousands of permutations of their idea different keys retrograde flipping it around all of these different things and when you get stuck i always tell them to play through them mm. play through these ideas because you know it's 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 one of the things that i said i tell my students all the time when you go to church you learn, it says, seek and ye shall find. It doesn't say ye shall find. Right. So you have to go out and seek. In order to do that, you know, a lot of times we want things to just come our way and think that it's going to fall into place. No, but you have to do the work. Because, right. you know, I, I've, I've, there's, there's, there's been times when I've gotten stuck and I've gone through this process and I find an idea and I go, oh, there it is right there. And then mm -hmm. there's other times when I've gotten stuck gone through the process and I go, oh, that's a cool idea. And that becomes a new tune. Right. I mean, oh, that's, I mean, I guess it's sort of like writing in the sense that, you know, sometimes when I have writer's block, it's like, well, then sit down and write something, right? <laughs> because the, pro the, the activity of writing is the activity. I do think it should be noted that I am speaking to uh, the Miles Davis Award winner uh, from the Montreal International Jazz Festival, just to loop it back to our first question. So we're going to take a quick commercial break. And I'm here with Terrence Blanchard on The Blackest Questions. Don't forget, you can listen to the Griot's Writing Black podcast hosted by me, Maisha Kai. This isn't your typical writing podcast. We interview any and everybody that has anything to do with writing, from comics to poets to authors to journalists to politicians and more. Remember, that's Writing Black every Sunday right here on the Griot's Black Podcast Network. Download the Griot's app to listen to Writing Black wherever you are. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Griot Mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. Okay, we are back. I'm here with Terrence Blanchard. We're playing the Blackest Questions. Terrence, are you ready for question number two? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This okay. director is a professor of the Master Series, Directing Strategies. It's a course at a prominent university. Who is he? Spike. That's Spike. Spike. <laughs> so yeah. you were on a roll. Spike Lee, Academy Award winner Spike Lee's iconic bo body of storytelling has made an indelible mark on filmmaking and television. Most recently in 2021, he, re he directed New York City Epicenters about 9-11, which was a four episode television miniseries. And he uh, co-wrote The Five Bloods for Netflix. He's directed uh, the version of David Byrne's American Utopia, which was released on HBO. And prior to The Five Bloods, the visionary filmmaker co-wrote and directed the Academy Academy Award nominated and critically acclaimed hit film Black Klansman, which he won an Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay. His career spans over 30 years and includes She's Gotta Have It, School Days, which is my favorite, Do the Right Thing, Mo Better Blues, Jungle Fever, Malcolm X, Crooklyn, Clockers, Girl Six, Get on the Bus, He Got Game, Summer of Sam, Bamboozled, 25th Hour, She Hate Me, Inside Man, Miracle at Santa Ana, Red Hook Summer, Old Boy, and Chirac. And Lee's outstanding feature documentary work includes the double Emmy Award winning If God is Willing and The Creek Don't Rise and a follow up to his HBO documentary film When the Levees Broke, A Requiem in Four Acts and the Peabody Award winning A Huey P. Newton Story. So you and Spike go way back. Um, yeah. And most of the films I mentioned uh, <laughs> were Spike was the director, you were also the composer. So how did you come to work with Spike uh, for all these years? And what's that, what's that sort of creative relationship like? You know, when it comes to working with Spike, man, it, it, it totally happened by accident. But you see, that's one of the things that I try to tell my students too. You have to be prepared at any mm. given time because opportunity will knock when you least expect it, you know? So we were working on, I think it was uh, More Better Blues okay. and we were doing a pre-recorded music for the actors to sing to in all of the band scenes. And we had taken a break and I was working on an album 
my first solo album for Columbia Records. And I had written this tune called Sing Soweto, which was a tune written for those kids who were massacred, you know, in mm-hmm. Soweto years ago. And when I started playing it, you know, Spike walked by and he goes, hey, man, what's that? I said, oh, well, this is this tune I'm working on. And he goes, man, I want to I want to use that. Can I use that? And I said, sure. So when we recorded it that day, we just recorded it as a solo trumpet piece. And they shot the scene with Denzel on the bridge, you know, and once they got that scene back to the editing room, you know, Spike felt like there was, wasn't enough stuff going on in the scene and it felt kind of empty. So he called me up and he goes, hey man, you think you can write a string arrangement for that for that tune? And I always tell people I lied and say, yes. Of course. <laughs> and of course. And then I called Roger, you know, my composition teacher. I said, hey Roger, I got this project and I don't know what to do. And I'm thinking he's gonna give me something like really concrete, you know, being my mentor. Uh-huh. He said, trust your training. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that was his answer. But, you know, it was the best thing that he could tell me to do because I went back and I just kind of sat down and I said, well, look, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to go whole hog. And if I fail, I still have a career as a jazz musician. So I just went from my heart, wrote it and handed it in. Here's the the, the kicker, got to the studio and handed the music to Spike's dad, Bill Lee, who was writing all of the other music. And Spike's dad goes, hey, man, you wrote it, you conducted. And I was like, excuse me? (laughs) Oh, right, because now I'm a conductor, too. (laughs) Right, right. So then the next thing you know, um, I was so fortunate for my upbringing in New Orleans and the arts high school that I went to. When we did sight singing class, they taught us how to, where the beats were as a conductor. So one is here, two, three, four. So at least I knew that part. This hand didn't know what to do. So this hand just... Jazz hand? Yeah. It's just (laughs) like, hey, that's all it did. But this hand did all of the work. And um, once we finished it, you know, Spike goes, man, you got a feature in this business. And I said, oh, thank you. And I didn't think nothing of it. But then he called me to do Jungle Fever. And then we've been working together ever since. Now, I know that, you know, most times artists are like, oh, I don't have a favorite. All my projects are different. I love them all. Come on. (laughs) It's It's just the two of us talking and, you know, a few listeners. What Spike film that you've worked on has like a special place in your heart where you're just like, you know what, this was, this one is, I mean, I know Mo Better Blues is kind of your first big one, but like, what are some of the other ones where you're like, yeah, I kind of love this one special? Well, um, the one that's really special is Malcolm X. Mm. Even though it was my second film and there's a lot of things that I needed to learn, you know, after doing that film, but I think it was just the nature of what it was. You know, it's a it's an a, it's an epic movie. Spike did an amazing mm-hmm. job. Denzel's performance was off the chain, and I was just totally inspired by what I saw on screen. You know, and tried to do my best to help support that film. Uh, and then next after that, probably Miracle at Saint Anna for similar reasons. You know, um, when I worked on Miracle at Saint Anna, Spike was sending me all of these still pictures, and I thought it was just gorgeous the way it looked. And um, that score kind of wrote itself. I just remember being nervous about it. But once I sat down to work with it, all of the scenes just started to flow and work. You know, I always tell people that's probably the easiest one that I've ever written because even though it's a lot of music, you know, it just came to me. You know, it was something, it was a unique experience that I've, that I really have. You know, that's, um, Malcolm X had such a special place in a lot of folks, you know, hearts and minds, just because, you know, people of my generation, you know, some of us had read the autobiography of Malcolm X, but Spike's book, I think, introduced a lot of people to Malcolm X, Spike's work, uh, and and motivated them to then go ahead and read the book. But that soundtrack is it's an emotional guide to how we should feel as far as, you know, the the depth of Malcolm's intellect and his love of Black people. I always remember there's some scenes with Delroy Lindo that yes. just have such beautiful, I mean, his acting, you know, I'm, I'm a Delroy Lindo fan. When I went to go see uh, yeah. Fire Shut Up In My Bones, uh, your, your opera at the Met, first Black man to put on an opera at the Met 
over their 130 year history, by the way. Uh, he was in the audience and I just remember bumping into him and him having just such wonderful things to say about you and your work, because as an actor, you brought out the best in him in some ways by supporting his brilliant performance with this with this score. Um, so, yeah, but, I, I, just, I have to, you know, I have to tell you something that's so interesting about what you just said about Malcolm X. One of the things that made me so proud of that film was I'll never forget once we had done it, it, it hadn't come out yet. And uh, I was in New Orleans and I went to the barber shop just to get a haircut. And I walked in and, you know, the barber um, obviously remembered who I knew I was and knew that I had worked on this movie. So when I walked in, they're like, hey, you know, back <laughs> yeah, you know, what's up, what's up, what's up? And, uh, you know, they were talking about what I was doing. And then they said, you know, this guy just did the music to Spike's new movie, Malcolm X. And within seconds, the conversation switched from me to responsibility in the African-American community and how Black men need to step up to the table. And I watched this conversation just shift and it became, it took over the entire barbershop. And it was amazing to think that, man, just the mention of a film can spark this kind of debate in our community. And that made me feel proud to be a part of something that can do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I always love your scores though, because as diverse and distinct as they are, they always seem to have a little Easter egg that sort of lets <laughs> listeners know it's like, this is a Terrence Blanchard joint. <laughs> like, every time I listen to it, you know, I was watching a movie, um, Gloria Estefan and uh, oh, Andy wow. Garcia were in a movie. Yeah. I, I want to say it's like Father of the Bride. It's like a- Father of the Bride, yeah. Yeah, Father of the Bride. And, I just, you know, on a Saturday night, I was just, you know, let me just put on something nice and fun and kind of smooth it out. It was, you know, raining outside. Mm -hmm. And this movie, you know, it's, it's funny. It's a typical father's right. bride story, you know, right. missing right. his daughter, all this other stuff. But, you right. know, my heartstrings were being pulled. I was like, this right. is a comedy. It's a little rom-com. And I was just like, this <laughs> is reminding me of, you know, other films that I've known and loved that are just kind of deeper, you know, like a Malcolm X level, a jungle fever, where it's, it's pulling me to really think about life and who I am. And then at the end, it says Terrence Blanchard, original composition. I was like, I knew it. I was like, there's a reason why I'm watching this movie, chuckling, but also feeling some kind of way. <laughs> you know what was funny about that film? You know, whenever you do demos for, for films, you try to make the demo sound as realistically as possible. Well, Trying to do a jazz score demo is in, is incredibly difficult because I'm not a drummer, I'm not a pianist, I'm not a bassist, right? So whenever I would have these demos, they would literally just sound very lame, Chrissy. You know what I mean? And you know, and the director was in this room going, "Well, I don't know." I'm like, "Hey, man, listen, let me tell you." I said, "This when you hear real musicians, it's going to be totally different." So we had Christian McBride, oh, yeah. uh, uh, Jonathan Barber. Uh, Gerald Clayton and Charles Altura in the rhythm section, right? So I'll never forget. He was still nervous. He was really nervous. We get to the first day of this, uh, the session. We do the first cue, and the band is killing. They are just killing it. And, and as soon as we finished the first take, I looked into the control room, and I said, do you get it now? <laughs> and they were like, yeah. I, I loved it. I loved it. And those, you know, and I, I think, what I always hear you saying, and, and we had a conversation about this with Herbie Hancock as well, mm -hmm. it's you're constantly referencing your past mentors and you're oh. constantly referencing your students and the younger musicians that you've brought along to sort of show them some of the opportunities. But it's also because other jazz musicians have done that to you in the process. And I remember you and some of your bandmates talking about Herbie Hancock doing that and really kind of just plucking folks you know, yeah. who have talent and just showing them not just the world, but mm -hmm. the industry uh, mm -hmm. and just other ways to work with musicians and how to be a professional jazz musician from start to finish. And I love that there's always an education piece to every project and every interview that you give where it's a constant connection to the past mentorship and the future mentees. No, it's, it's, it's part of that whole thing about what your show is about. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's it's really about passing on this information one generation to the next. And I've been working a lot with Herbie lately, you know, and, you know, when I saw you on tour with Herbie over the summer, you know, that was an incredible experience for me because, you know, being on tour with him for six weeks, playing with him every night was magical. But mm -hmm. I, have to, 
conversations on the bus were even more impressive. You know, mm -hmm. just listening to his thought process, getting the background of his history of some things that I didn't know, you know, and then just being around him and watching how he operates has been a huge, huge blessing for me, you know, and it's one of those things where you have to pass that on because that's what happened to me. Clark Terry, uh, uh, Milt Hinton, Freddie Hubbard, they all, Woody, Woody Shaw, Dizzy Gillespie, they all put their arms around me and just said, hey, man, come in, you need to check this out. Why don't you check this out? Listen to this. Do you know about this? Mm -hmm. And those kind of types of things are the things that really helped me to grow. So it would be very selfish of me to have that experience and not pay that forward. Mm -hmm. you know, so for me, it's all about paying it forward. And also it's about allowing young people to realize their own strengths, you know, because if I'm telling you that I'm no different than you, hopefully that strikes a tone within you to let you know you could do anything you want to do if you put your heart and mind to it. And I know we hear that all the time. It's a cliche, but I'm living, I'm a living example of it. You know, I was a kid who didn't think I was going to go too far in the music business, but I love music. And the only thing I wanted to do was to be good at it. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, that opened doors for me that I didn't know existed. I didn't even know the doors were there. And traveling the world, playing for different presidents, doing all of the things that I've done over the course of my career, I have to, you know, go back to all of the people in that village right. that had a hand and just like, you know, giving me information and giving me inspiration. And establishing that foundation. Ah. Oh. Yeah. I adore Terrence Blanchard. You have no idea. Okay, yeah. we're going to take a quick commercial break, and we are playing The Blackest Questions with Terrence Blanchard. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio mobile app and tune in everywhere. Great podcasts are heard. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. And we are back. We're headed to question number three. You are two for two, Mr. Blanchard. Are you ready? I know it's gonna get a little tougher. Just, just <laughs> touch. Okay. <laughs> this American jazz percussionist and band leader began mm. his music career playing drums and took up this instrument in the late 1920s. Who is he and what is the instrument? Wow, percussionist. You got me. You got me there in the twenties. Wow. Percussionist and band leader who right. took up this instrument in the late 1920s. Um, uh, Cab Calloway? No. Lionel Hampton. Played the, the song. I played the, it for years. That's you know what? right. I, yeah, yeah. And you know what? I always forget that he was a drummer. And see, when you say percussionist, I'm thinking percussion. You know what I mean? Wow. Oh. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. Lionel Hampton is one of the most extraordinary musicians of the 20th century, and his artistic achievements symbolize the impact of jazz music that's had on our culture for the 21st century. So the Lionel Hampton Orchestra became known around the world for its first-class jazz musicianship. And as a composer and arranger, Hampton wrote more than 200 works, including the jazz standards Flying Home, Evil Gal Blues, and Midnight Sun. He also composed the major symphonic work King David Suite. And so Hampton worked with jazz musicians from Teddy Wilson, Benny Good Goodman, Buddy Rich, to Charlie Parker, Charles Mingus, and Quincy Jones. So you began, uh, you worked with Lionel Hampton at some point. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit more about that relationship. Oh, no, it was, a, that that was my first major gig in the business. You know, I was playing at, I was going to school at Rutgers University. Okay. And um, my teacher there, Paul Jeffries, was in the band. And he said, man, why don't you come by and hang out 
on one of the gigs. And this is actually a week before school started. I got to New Jersey early, so I was just staying at his house. So, and he said, man, bring your horn. So we actually drove up to New York to drive down to Philly with the band. And we were playing this outdoor gig and I'd been talking to some of the trumpet players on the bus and uh, they wanted to hear me play, you know, so they asked me to pull out my horn. And, and when you're like 17? Yeah, I'm like, okay. yes, 18, 18. And uh, I'm uh, just noodling around with them. Lionel walks up behind me and he called everybody champ. Hey champ, hey champ. Let me hear you play a blues with the piano player. Was, his name was Zeke Mullins at the time. And uh, here I played the blues with him. And next thing you know, I was in the gig. I was on the gig the next week, <laughs> you know. So, so Rutgers. I started, on weekend. I started going out on every weekend with him. Okay. Wow. So, you know, Lionel Hampton, uh, I had a, a four disc CD set that I used to listen to yes. when I was in, in uh, high school and in college. But you mentioned earlier that you are composing uh, the music for this documentary about legendary Louis Armstrong, uh, titled Louis Armstrong, Black and Blues. And mm -hmm. so being a jazz musician, mm -hmm. tell us what it means to you when you score these impactful documentaries of our legends. Because to my knowledge, has there ever been a documentary about Lionel Hampton? No, not that I know of, you know, uh, and there should be. Maybe yeah. I'm putting some some homework on your plate. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Because listen, because the thing is, when you said 1920s, I don't even picture him in that right. period. You know, I'm picturing because and I think that's a testament to his brilliance in a way, because I'm still picturing him as part of the 50s and the 60s. You right. Know, because of everything that started to happen. But you go back to that earlier stuff he did with Teddy Wilson and Benny Goodman, all that stuff. That was those were great recordings as well. You know, but he definitely belongs you know, amongst those who have documentaries done about their lives, because, you know, he, it, 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 he was a, he was an interesting guy, you know, yeah. politically, he was a Republican, you know, and he had a lot of different ideas about social injustice and his musical prowess was just totally amazing. I, I'll just tell you this one story. He had, I think he had perfect pitch, you know, um, so I got to the, one of the gigs we were doing at Radio City Music Hall. I got there early and I was sitting around, messing around on the piano. And then Hamp jumped up and he started playing with me without knowing the music. And he started playing with me on the piano. And I was like, wow, okay, that's kind of cool, man. I'm playing with Lionel Hampton. And then all of a sudden it sounded like he wasn't playing with me at all. I'm like, what is he doing? That's crazy. And then I realized, because we were playing in the lobby of the um, uh -huh. Radio City the music that was playing in the speakers, he, he switched from playing to me to playing to the music. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, his ears were just incredible. I mean, you know, he's he was an incredible musician. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really learned a lot being in that band. Well, it seems as though, you know, each time you are on tour with someone, you learn something. I, I think that's the, the beauty of, you know, when you talk to musicians, the beauty of going on tour. And sometimes, listen, it's not always positive things that you learn, but sometimes right. you learn, okay, I don't want to be like that person. But it seems right. though, you, you you know, you mentioned before, you had all these older jazz musicians that literally took you under their wing, but you had to also be present and prepared to yeah. be mentored. Yes, oh, definitely. i never forget, there was one gig that I did it was with Jay McShann. It was called the Jay McShann All-Stars. And you had uh, all of these veteran, Al Gray, all of these veteran musicians. And i never forget back in the dressing room, one of the things that blew me away was watching these guys who were in their 70s at the time still talk about music with a certain type of excitement and, and exuberance. You know, and I was like, wow, look at this. You know, they're not back here talking about anything frivolous. They're still talking about, hey, man, you know, that tune was a beautiful tune. Mm -hmm. But everybody plays the verse. Everybody plays the body of the tune. But the verses, and that to me was a was a, was a a big, big moment in my life to understand why they were so, so successful. Because mm -hmm. they truly, truly loved what they did. It wasn't a job. It was really something that was inside of them. Well, I mean, I definitely saw that, you know, for our, our listeners out there, I had the opportunity of seeing Terrence Blanchard perform with Herbie Hancock this summer uh, when I was celebrating my birthday in Rome with my younger niece, who literally said that that was like a life-changing experience. But to see Herbie Hancock, who looks fabulous, by the way, who's in his early 80s, just yeah. have this 
joie de vivre, you know, yeah. I mean, like this excitement. I mean, there were young people on their feet, but you could tell he was giving them energy and they were giving him energy back. I mean, it was, you know, I could only hope that at that age I could be that that excited about anything, but also have that much energy. And the talent level was ridiculous. I mean, look, let me tell you something, Chrissy. One of the things we were laughing about that entire time throughout the entire tour, people say, man, how's it going? I said, bro, what do you think you would feel like to get your butt kicked by an 82 year old man? Every, night after night. Every night. You know what I mean? And the thing about it, I mean, you know, Herb is Buddhist and I've been Buddhist, you know, for a number of years and we would chant before the show, man. And I remember one night we chanted before the show and just as we finished, Herbie just said, all right, he said, uh, all right, time to hit the killing fields. And we were like, what? <laughs> Excuse me, you know? <laughs> and we all looked at each other like, oh, it's gonna be one of them type of nights. One of, one of those nights. Oh my God. And you know, well, you saw it, you saw it firsthand how it was. I mean, he's the type of guy when, you, when he's playing a solo, you think, he's about to hit the apex of the solo and next thing you know there's two other gears right you know? now here here's a question because i you know we've had comedians on the show and i've talked to a lot of comedians who weren't able to perform during covid and for many of them it felt like they were like losing they like lost a limb you know like they need to be on a stage to feel whole to feel alive during mm -hmm. the beginning stages of covid when we we're all pretty much locked down and you couldn't you know connect with an audience you couldn't tour how was it was it a helpful experience so you could just kind of take a beat and write and think and reflect or were you kind of itching like some of these comedians where it's like i need to perform in front of an audience to to kind of get my mind right no for me it was it was a beautiful experience in a weird way i hate to say it like that because there was so much tragedy going around and around the world but it was beautiful because our two younger daughters had come back home and we were all huddled, huddled up in the house and i got a chance to spend time with my family in a way that I hadn't for mm -hmm. years, you know? Mm -hmm. And we were we were all there, at least there for at least a year, you know, in the house. And it was, it was, it was beautiful and rough because you got two young adults right. <laughs> you know, in the house. So they were more hey, hey, listen, your wife didn't put you out, your daughters didn't put you out. Like I think this is a success. <laughs> Yeah, no, as a matter of fact, I started DJing some jazz shows, you know, but I saw DJ Nice and what he was doing, D Nice, and I was said, let me do something similar with, with the jazz shows. And I remember one, one day, man, when I did it, I said, this song is for everybody who's tired of that person that's getting on their last nerve in that apartment. <laughs> I know and, that's uh, right. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people... Uh, <laughs> Oh, a lot of people. Oh, yeah, a lot of <laughs> a lot of people are like. Thank now, you. Now, here's here's my my last question before we move on to uh, our next question. You know, you've documented the process for a, a various documentaries. Have you ever thought about having the cameras turn on you so others can see your thought process and your creative process? Since mentorship is such a large part of who you are as a musician. You're, you're so in tune to what's going on. There's, there's talk about doing that right now. Um, so let's see what happens. I'm I'm a little nervous about it because I, I I don't tend to think that I do anything interesting enough that would want, warrant there being a documentary about me, you know, but- This guy doesn't know he's Terrence Blanchard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but people are talking about it. So let's see what happens. Okay, well, we're playing the Blackest Questions. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and I'm here with Terrence Blanchard. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black fashions, Black mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. Don't forget... You can listen to The Griot's Writing Black podcast hosted by me, Maisha Kai. This isn't your typical writing podcast. We interview any and everybody that has anything to do with writing, from comics to poets to authors to journalists to politicians and more. Remember, that's Writing Black every Sunday right here on The Griot's Black Podcast Network. Download The Griot's app to listen to Writing Black wherever you are. 
And we are back playing the blackest questions. Terrence, are you ready for question number four? Man, after I blew three, I, I should have known three. Yeah, but the 1920 was got was, was the thing that got me. Okay. Yeah, we like to throw in a little little spice here and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah you got me. You got me. Okay. Okay, so question number four, and spice is gonna be a hint. This mm. parade has roots in Harlem, where the founder and her West Indian friends celebrated carnival costume parties in ballroom spaces throughout the 1920s. What is the parade and who is the founder? Oh, I have no idea. I gotta okay. tell you that right now. I'm I'm trying to rack my brain about it, but when you say parade, you know I'm going back home. So you know, <laughs> those are all of I have no idea. Okay, so this is the West Indian Day Parade. Oh, yes. Founded by Jesse Waddle. And so the origins of the West Indian Day Parade can be traced back to private pre-Lenten carnival parties held by Caribbean immigrants in and around Harlem. And this Trinidadian, <laughs> Jesse Waddle, started yeah. a carnival in Harlem, complete with costume parties at renowned spaces such as the Savoy and the Audubon ballrooms. And then mm. the nature of the celebration soon required bigger venues and turned to the streets on Labor Day once Waddle received a street permit in 1947. So in 1964, the Harlem permit was revoked due to uh, a little bit of a violent riot. And so five years later, a committee was organized by Trinidadian Carlos Lezama and obtained he obtained another permit for a parade on Eastern Parkway in Brooklyn. So the mm. parade has been held on Eastern Parkway ever since. And right. it begins on Eastern Parkway and Utica Avenue and ends at Grand Army Plaza. For those of our listeners who are in New York and have uh, experienced the West Indian Day Parade. So you are a child of New Orleans. And we know Fat Tuesday and Mardi Gras is part of your heritage. Yes. Uh, and you, But you did live in Brooklyn for a time. And I've been to that parade. You've been to the parade, right? Yeah. And so did yeah. you ever go to Jouvet the night before? Did you go no. to the parade? So what was the experience no. like back then? And did you ever play in the parade or were you there as a, as a reveler? No, 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 no. I just went to the parade. And, uh, you know, the parades up north, no disrespect to the East Coast. That's all right. So it was so different from the parades down south that it was it was a unique experience because the parades down south just seemed like a party, you mm -hmm. know, because the bands are playing like really exciting music. We get excited by the, all of the marching bands. They're trying to outdo one another. Uh, and it's just a party atmosphere. And it was a similar, it was a party atmosphere in Brooklyn. It was just different. And it was culturally different because the food was different, the music was different. And I enjoyed it. It was an eye-opening experience for me because it, it helped open my eyes to another culture, you know, and how other cultures would celebrate certain events. So I I, I really enjoyed it. I've, I've been to it a few times. I didn't know it started in Harlem, though. That was the thing. Yes, indeed. And then it shifted to Brooklyn. And we know that Brooklyn and Harlem have such long histories of uh, Afro-Caribbeans who have been here for over a century now. Yes. Um, you know, I always think about these geographic uh, distinctions just because when I teach, I always want to know where my students are from, because that tells me a lot about uh, just kind of how they think about things. You know, sometimes it's cuisine. You know, I when I teach in the fall, I always ask, you know, what they're making for Thanksgiving, because, you know, even Black folks from the North versus the South might have different uh, food on the table. But when you think about your time in New York, what really resonates for you, you know, musically, you're interacting with different types of musicians, presumably from all over the country. Um, but what else was was part of your time in New York that you really hold tight to? Well, it's so interesting. Part of it, it, it it's a combination of things. Part of it was the traveling, mm. but I was always traveling from New York back to New York. I wasn't going to New Orleans much. And in doing that, I was going to all of these other countries and coming back to a city that was filled with all of these different cultures. You know, so from a little country boy from New Orleans, man, it was like culture shock at first, you know, to my system. But it was something that I, I I I really enjoyed because I was learning so much, and I remember going to London, uh, and I had a friend of mine who's a percussionist who was from Nigeria, and uh, I told him I said, "Hey man, uh, I really want to experience traditional uh, Nigerian food. So can you know you have a Nigerian dinner for me at your home one night?" He said, "Oh man, no problem, no problem." So I get to his house, and he literally had uh, fish and a red gravy black eyed peas and rice and plantains. And I was like, yo, dude, no, I, I want to eat. I, I grew up on this. Right. This is my food. I didn't say cook what I want. I said cook what you want. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that was one of the first moments where you start to really feel connected mm -hmm. to something that you have been 
disconnected from. Uh -huh. you know? And it was an eye-opening experience, but I had a lot of those types of experiences in New York. You know, when you talk about the West Indian culture, man, that food was something that was like really, really, really interesting to me because it was similar to Louisiana cooking in terms of concept, mm -hmm. you know, about making do with what you had, you know what I mean? And it really enforced this whole notion of the creativity mm -hmm. that our cultures have, have had over generations that we now kind of take for granted. I mean, you know, because when you think about these cuisines, man, somebody had to sit down and look at those ingredients and put those things together in a way that was distinctly ours. Absolutely. You know, I've had a few chefs on The Blackest Questions. We had Michael Twitty, who's uh, Black and Jewish, and he has a, a new book out called Kosher Soul. We have Nadej Florimond, who's a Haitian chef right here in Brooklyn. And, you know, we talked about different things from okra and plantains and Black eyed peas. And, you know, I, I eat my grits in a special way that uh, I don't want to tell you because you might leave the podcast. Um, but I'm fascinated by, you know, we're eating the same foods sometimes in very similar ways and how food is this great connector, the same way in many ways, music is this great connector, exactly. you know, exactly. across boundaries. Now, do you do, this is just a quick question. Do you do the, um, the Coca-Cola shop when you travel? Cause I know your passport is hot. <laughs> no, no, no. What is the Coca-Cola? So, I, I have this thing whenever I travel internationally, I wake up every morning and just take like a little shot of Coca-Cola because it coats the stomach. And so then, and I love street meat. I love to eat whatever the locals are eating. I want to eat it. So as long as I have a little bit of Coca-Cola in the morning, I'm good to go for, I don't know how long I'm on the road. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Coca-Cola is my miracle drug when I travel. So I always ask people who travel a lot, you know, like what's, what is, yeah. uh, we had a, Jessica Nbongo, who's the first Black woman who went to every country in the world. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, she gave us some little tricks of the trade as to what she likes when she travels. But my secret is Coca-Cola. What's your What's secret on? when you're on the road traveling Vod with a band? Vodka. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it kills anything that's down there. That's so. right. It's, it's like a medicine. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I had a uh, saxophone player in my band years ago. He was starting to get a cold. I said, listen, bro, take a shot of vodka right mm -hmm. now. And he goes, what? I said, man, take a shot of vodka right now. And when he did it, you know, next thing you know, it just kind of cleared everything up and he was fine. Right. That's been my kind of like my go-to, but I don't do it in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone, everyone has everything, but Coca-Cola is my, it, it sort of makes sure I can, I can eat everything I want. Bourbon is my little, um, when I feel a cold coming on, I got that from my grandmother. And, you know, right. my grandparents are from, uh, my maternal grandparents are from Florida, Northern Florida, which right. feels like the deep, deep South. So right. again, you know, when the New Orleans relatives would come to Northern Florida, I mean, it, it was basically like, oh, you guys are just like down the street doing basically the same right. things, just right. exactly. a little bit of a flair. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yes. All right, well, we're gonna take a quick break and come back with question number five for Terrence Blanchard. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black fashions, Black mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Griot Mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. And we are back. We're playing the Blackest Questions. I'm here with Oscar nominee and Emmy Award winner, Terrence Blanchard. Terrence, are you ready for question number five? Sure. Okay. Uh-oh. What is the most common language spoken as a first language by South Africans? Oh, by South Africans. Yoruba. No. It's, no? It's Zulu. Oh, come on. Zulu really? is South Africa's biggest language, spoken by almost a quarter of the population. Oh, South, 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 African. Oh, South, South Africa. 
I so go I, I speak Yoruba, actually. I went to the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, and I learned Yoruba. Okay. Um, but Zulu is, and so there are other official language, Hossa and Afrikaans and English. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but South Africa is a country on the southernmost tip of the African continent, marked yeah. by several distinct ecosystems. You've got your inland safari destination, Kruger National Park, with mm -hmm. big game. You've got your Western Cape with beaches and lush winelands around Stellenbosch. You've got your craggy cliffs at Cape of Good Hope. You've got forests and lagoons along the Garden Route and the city of Cape Town beneath a flat top table mountain. So... I know that you spoke to my producer about the eye-opening safari in South Africa yes. uh, when you visited. I went to Kruger National Park many years ago over Christmas, actually, for like a 10-day safari. So mm -hmm. that was an eye-opening experience for you. When was your last visit and when do you plan on going back? It's been a few years since I've been there and I, I hope to go back pretty soon because I've been there twice and each time that I've gone there, I, I can't even explain the experience to you. You know, it's it's... You know, when people tell you when you get their welcome home, you know, mm -hmm. it really resonates because while I'm walking around the country, I'm, I, I have to stop my inclination to speak to everybody because they look like somebody I know, right. or somebody that I grew up with, you know what I mean? And it's yes. like, and the, the wild part about it, what was really freaking me out was I saw a couple of people that look like people I know in their younger years. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. look, that look, oh, wait a minute. No, he's my age. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, the other part of it, too, is that I remember doing a master class, you know, at a couple of schools there. And I thought I was bombing because the kids were so quiet. And I realized, no, they were hanging on every word. Mm. And they were really anxious to learn, you know. So for me, I really would love to be a part of that. That educational process in South Africa because it's also a learning thing for me. That safari that I went on was, man, first of all, you know, you go on this safari and you're in this, you're, you're, you're in this big vehicle. And when they tell you that the spring buck can jump over that thing with oh, no yeah. problem, you know, you sit there and you go, oh, okay, so we're really not as safe as I thought we were. Right. <laughs> Oh, and you start to see all of these different animals. But the thing that got me was, you know, we get back to home base and they prepared a lunch for us outside. And we're outside sitting on the on a, the balcony, not the balcony, but on the porch, on the mm -hmm. ground level of this building. And just like maybe 100 yards away, I see movement. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's Springbok move right like right there. You know what I mean? And then the guy was telling me, he go, oh, yeah, he says, Usually it's the hippos, but the hippos are over by the owner's house. <laughs> He's feeding them for lunch. And I went, what? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, being in nature also is so helpful with the creative process. I was yes. just telling someone, you know, I'm a birder. And so uh, going out and birding helps me come back and like sit down and write. But I'll right. never forget, you know, whitewater rafting on the Zambezi, which was part of like this Kruger oh trip yeah. and I asked the guy and I said hey listen are there crocodiles in this water he says yes of course there are crocodiles ha 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 so you know we're right. all splashing around we stay in the water for 30 minutes right. we're waiting for the other boats to come down and then right. we finally get out you know we get our boat out we're sort of getting ready to walk back up this massive cliff he says hey look there's a crocodile and I was like sir I asked you specifically <laughs> if there were crocodiles and he said and Chrissy I said yes I said no you said yes ha 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 I was like in America that means no he said but in South, like in Zimbabwe that means yes <laughs> I think also culturally you know you have to remember I was like I, I know my grandparents are looking down on us like what are you doing out of here course, with of these animals of course, of course hey man you know I thought about the same thing you know when you sit down luckily we didn't see, you know, the 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 cats, the big cats weren't around. None of those, you know, they weren't around. Um, but still, when you're out there and you're in their world, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's something. And I think the driver man played a trick on us. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But you know, every now and then they stop the truck, you know, for us to just sit there and they talk to us, right? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the stops, man, the dude couldn't get the truck to stop. <laughs> you know and i'm like yo bro that ain't funny <laughs> you know what i mean it's like right. on, bro. The, we have a, a situation <laughs> oh baby we was getting ready to get out there and push out that thing you know what I mean? <laughs> now here's the thing 
so you've I know you've traveled extensively, uh, uh-huh. and, you know, from a very young age with so many musicians. What's still on your bucket list? What's on your wish list of a place that you want to go and visit and perform? Um, I've, I've, I've never really exp- I've been to Northern Africa and South Southern Africa, South Africa. I've never really been in the Central Park. And mm-hmm. that's something that's been on my bucket list for a long time. You know, because I, uh, one of the things as a jazz musician and as an African-American that I've always uh, had a deep feeling about is that we mostly tour European countries, you know, and we we tour to tour, tour America, obviously, you know what I mean? But when you look at the global perspective, you know, of people around the globe, you know, where, the, where, where a good portion of this music emanates from, is a place that we don't get to tour much. Right. You know? And that's something that's always been a curious thing for me as to why. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, uh, it, and it's an interesting thing because I know what those trips have done for me, you know, what they've, how they've opened my eyes to a lot of things that are going on in the world, you know, um, made me have more confidence mm. about myself, uh, and made me have more pride you know, and where I come from and the history that comes behind just what it took to make me, you know? Um, so that's, th- those are the things that are on my bucket list, you know? And I remember hearing a story, you know, about Louis Armstrong wanting to retire there. Because mm. you know? I, I think he was in Nigeria, I'm not sure. He looked out in the audience, similar experience that I had, he looked out in the audience and saw a woman that looked like one of his aunts and just blew him away. Wow. And, you know, uh, uh, reportedly, I don't know if it's true or not, because I don't even think it's, I don't, I can't remember if it's in the documentary, um, um, but reportedly he was building a retirement house there where he wanted to go and spend more time there. Oh, I cannot wait for this documentary to come out. I can't wait to see what you do uh, with your work. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and then when we come back, we're going to play Black Lightning with Terrence Blanchard. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Griot mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. Uh oh, Black Lightning. Okay, we're back. Terrence, before we let you out of here, we've got time for the Black Bonus Round, which I love to call Black Lightning. Now, this is just, it's a yes or no answer, right? These are just from the gut. There's no right or wrong answer, okay? Okay. Okay, here we go. Black Lightning. City with the best food, New Orleans or New York? Ooh, New Orleans. Best boxing champion, Tyson or Mayweather? Tyson. School days or jungle fever? Ooh. School days. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Both are on and you can't flip the channels. Are you watching the Pelicans or the Saints? Saints. Oh, well, you know what? Let me back up. <laughs> Let me back up. Right now, this year, Pelican. Okay. Pelican. Uh, Magic Johnson or Dr. J? Oh, that's so wrong. That's so wrong. Magic. Trumpet or keyboard? Trumpet. If you had to choose composing or playing music? Playing. Billy Holiday or Etta James? Ooh, Billy Holiday. Gumbo or Jambalaya? Gumbo. Okra, gumbo. Mmm. Crawfish or Po' Boy? Po' Boy. And your favorite city to perform live? Anywhere where there's people who love music. Absolutely. Oh, Terrence, thank you so much for joining the Blackest Questions. I've learned a ton. 
I'm motivated, I'm inspired. I cannot wait to check out your documentary. I can't wait to see your opera at the at the opera in New York. Um, and that that opens in April? April, yes. Okay, mm-hmm. I, listen, I've got the email tab right. open. I gotta get my tickets to sweet. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for joining us here at The Blackest Questions and sharing just your love of music and your knowledge of music with all of us. And I want to thank you listeners for checking us out at The Blackest Questions. The show is produced by Sasha Armstrong, Akila Shedrick, Jeffrey Trudeau, and Regina Griffin is our managing editor of podcasts. And if you like what you heard, subscribe to this podcast so you never miss an episode. And please download the Grio app to to listen and watch many more great shows. Don't forget, you can listen to the Griot's Writing Black podcast hosted by me, Maisha Kai. This isn't your typical writing podcast. We interview any and everybody that has anything to do with writing, from comics to poets to authors to journalists to politicians and more. Remember, that's Writing Black every Sunday right here on the Griot's Black Podcast Network. Download the Griot's app to listen to Writing Black wherever you are. Witty, honest, entertaining. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the black culture debates you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. The Grio Black Podcast Network is here. Everything you've been waiting for. Black culture amplified. Find your voice on the Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard.